LinkedIn presents. This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with remarkable folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and my guest this week is Emily Potit, the founder and CEO of Advocate, a company that is revolutionizing the way people apply for benefits. Emily is not only a successful entrepreneur and venture capitalist, but also a passionate disability advocate who knows firsthand the challenges and frustrations of navigating the complex and often confusing social security disability insurance process. She decided to use her skills and experience to create Advocate, a platform that uses innovative technology to simplify, streamline, and automate the application process for benefits, making it more accessible, transparent, and user-friendly. Emily, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. So Emily, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is a friend of mine uh, mentioned the work you're doing. And I have, just so I'll give you a little context, I have this irrational relationship with fairness. I think since I was a little kid, I I would always use a word, that's not fair. And as an adult, I've used it in my everyday life in terms of like, I want everyone to get their fair share. (laughs) And so I feel like someone who's who's founded an organization like Advocate has that sort of like shared DNA with me of like fairness for everyone. What is your take on on fairness and how that's driven your work at Advocate? That is a great question. So when it comes to fairness and as it relates to Advocate, you know, I grew up in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, where there are many people, 20% of the town or more now are on some form of government subsidy. When I was growing up in that area, I really learned what it was like for people who had worse health outcomes to attempt to face off to a gigantic government. And while it might be acceptable for someone like me to navigate the system with a lot of resources and a lot of privilege, all across America, there are people who have an easier and harder time of getting what they've actually already earned from the federal government. And so outside of my three toddlers who tell me all the time, mama, that's not fair. I think I've been reflecting on what it means to get by in our country when you're sick. And that experience as a kid myself marked me because I saw all of my parents and many other family members make an attempt at accessing something that was further away from them because of who they are and where they are and who they were born into. And to me, that is something that a system can rectify And with Advocate, we're hoping to support the government in its ability to administer the programs along with their intent. I want to get into a couple of contextual things before we get into the work at Advocate. So first, uh, I know it's obviously uh, helping people with disabilities. What can we define people with disabilities on the jump here? Like, I feel like disabilities is such a broad word, and I'm sure it's something you tackle with every day because it's, it's, it's not it's a spectrum. How are we defining people with disabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So all of us have our health until we don't. And that might be the first moment of life or much later on. Whether you're a person who is experiencing illness or a disabling medical condition today or in the future, the government has a real particular definition of what it means according to the Social Security Administration, which is the first agency that we're facing off to at Advocate. And so for Social Security... You need to be found sick enough so that you can't do any job that you've done in the past decade or so. And the government is the one who looks at your case and your current health and determines if you are, in fact, that level of sick or disabled. There are many other definitions, as you alluded to, because we all have health and we're all human. But in this instance, the government's definition relates to substantial gainful activity. And what that means, it's full-time work. Okay. From what I understand, the government's pretty large. And so how are they able to judge these individuals on a case-by-case basis? Because this doesn't seem like, you know, know, obviously AI is a big part of everyone's conversation. I don't think AI is going to be able to figure this out. So how does the government currently identify if you are unable to maintain a full-time job? When it comes to the social security program, The government has an obligation and looks at the medical records of the person 
and takes those records and puts them in comparison to the code of federal regulation and how the description of different health and illness is written out in that legal code. And so there are a number of steps in the process, gathering the records, reviewing them. Um, an individual or a citizen has the right to an appeal. If they think, I'm so sick, I need a judge to look at this, that can be part of the process. But it's okay. really a sequential process of taking a look at what's on record about you and your health and whether or not it meets the terms of disability within the Code of Federal Regulation. Thank you very much for that. And there's something I call the entrepreneur's conundrum, the find a problem, fix a problem. Mm -hmm. And the problem you found is, and you actually have the, your your yeah. website's great, ouradvocates.com, where you have this counter. And underneath the counter, and it, the counter has at this point 1.8 uh, million, but it says Americans waiting in line for a life or death decision from the federal government. This is the problem you're trying to fix, I'm assuming. Correct. Right now, there are a number of Americans who have applied to the Social Security programs for support, Veterans Affairs, Federal Workmen's Compensation, and they're waiting for the decision. And as you said, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to do if you're missing an intake system, if you're missing an infrastructure. And I know you had mentioned, geez, I don't think AI can solve this. Well, I think it can. I can think it can solve a part of it. Right now, I have claimants. I'm a accredited disability rep who have died in the last month, two of them. One gentleman that I know of right now is homeless, and I'm sure there are many others that are on the brink of that situation. And so I don't find that weight to be acceptable. It is a life or death situation, and we're going to bring the best of technology to see what we can't do to decrease the wait time and support Americans and I'd say the government as well. So how does advocate work to to solve this problem and, and obviously cut down that list? What's part of the organizational structure that helps uh, these Americans that are, that are having this difficulty trying to access help and information? So advocate is just in its first steps as a company. So I'm going to speak to you about our mission and then what we're working on today. So really our mission is Joe, if you got sick and you, you could not do a single job, I believe that you should have an instantaneous influx of capital and support, not for, not for anything fancy. Our claimants tell us they need to buy groceries, they need to pay for their housing, and they need to buy prescriptions. That is what the money is for. And in fact, if you've been a taxpayer, the money you've set aside the money in a public benefit for yourself already. And so that instantaneous support is what we will achieve. There are maybe yeah. 50 pathways to get there. <laughs> um, and so let me tell you about the one that we're working on today. So right now we're focused in on a narrow part of Social Security Administration, which is ensuring that any data our claimants put into an application for a Social Security Disability Insurance. So the program where you're, if you're too sick to work, making sure that data is full, that the case is fully developed. So we've, we've grabbed all the medical records, they're in electronic format, and that we have presented what we believe is the best case for the claimant at the first moment of their application. Today, there's a bit of an assembly line where an individual can apply on their own, they can apply with a representative, but the process goes along. And the first step is gather the medical records. Well, hey, that happened after people apply. And so really, we are going to hook up to every database out there. And then we're going to compile a claim that we believe will be successful for the individual if it is there. Now, there's another side to this, which is to be very clear, what we are not creating are better odds for people than they ought to have. I want to be careful to say we're not going to construct a, an engine for fraud. And the way that I know this is we will be able to look and evaluate individuals' medical tests, their prescription, their doctor notes in advance so that if the evidence isn't there, we'll communicate to those individuals in advance that this, this might not be for them right now. So that's what we're working on today. We're working on the we're working on almost the precursor. I like to think of advocate as 
we are going to be the intake engine for these federal government entitlement programs. We are going to sit in front of the government and make sure whatever our clients, our individual clients are submitting is best fit for them, is true, and is positioned in terms that are extensible to a really complicated government system. Uh, you, you mentioned wait time, and we talk about the, the 1.8 million people waiting. You seem to have a lot of data at, at your fingertips. What is the average wait time for, for many of these people? Well, I can tell you that it depends on the condition, the health conditions. So let's just talk about Social Security and the, the state of affairs yeah. right now. Right now, there are a bunch of steps when you apply for Social Security. There's initial application. Then if you get if you don't win that one, you can have it reconsidered. If you don't win that one, you can have a number of appeals where you speak to judges, things like that. If you submitted an application today, it would be very likely that you wouldn't hear whether or not your application was approved or denied for 224 days. It might be down to 204, but in any case, you know. Jeez. The Wright brothers made a plane in 60 days. So I I really think we can uh. cut down that time. And, and, you know, there are cases that are on the margin. I want to give honor and kind of hold the space for the complexity of the process. It's not easy. It's complicated. But there are cases which are more clear cut. And we want to ensure that they're fully adjudicatable as early as possible because it, because it's, I think it's what's right. I think it's what's in line with the intent. Do you ever get pushback or maybe just maybe just sort of tangentially from people being like, Emily, this is just too big a problem to solve. Like, I don't know if you can fix this or be part of the solution because, you know, when, when it comes to the federal government and, it, you know, the connection for the federal government to the human beings, it's such a rigmarole as we've already detailed. Is the problem too big to fix? I've heard the problem is too big to fix. This is a crazy idea. Sounds like a scam to me. 99 <laughs> times out of 100. And to Weird. me, that is a wild advantage for me and our team and what we're going to build. Because I'm not attempting to say we'll rehabilitate and make everybody happy with any government program. But what I, the insight that I, I believe we do have as a group is that in private industry, we can construct in a righteous intake system so that when Americans are facing off to the government, they are supported, they understand what their chances are, and that they can access instantaneous support. When I think about solving every single problem at once, <laughs> that probably isn't the most strategic route. And I feel lucky that we've identified an area in which the instinctual reaction is what you just said. It is, it is not too big to fix, but the fact that everyone thinks it is means that there's a real first mover advantage that we have. I love that. That's awesome. And I know Advocate is already operational, but your web-based app is set to launch in the fall. Okay. Can you walk me through how it's going to work? Like, so sure. once, say September, October rolls around, there's an individual who who needs help there on this 200-day waiting period or, they, or they're about to start. Uh, uh -huh. Can you walk through how it all works? So- you know, I'm just going to speak about social security disability. That's how we're starting um, this. You yep. can imagine this intake idea could apply to, geez, uh, veterans. It could apply to immigrate other things, immigration, have commercial purposes. But today for social security disability claimants, we will have a view of the individual. They'll find us via phone, via marketing, via hopefully partnerships with social workers, partnerships with, with parole officers, things like that. And they will have an option to begin an application or appeal an application in a web-based flow, or they'll have an option to call us and work with one of our accredited advocates to evaluate what is within their health record. And then our system will present a case to the Social Security Administration that takes into account the health record as opposed to a self account from the individual. What it will feel like is what the person designs. There are really three pathways. You know, we've had 30% of users that we've we've asked, claimants that we've asked, they say, oh, for reasons um, of sometimes people say social anxiety, just personal preference, they would love to fill out all this information online and hook into all these accounts that they have. Um, the majority of people though would like to speak with us or they would like to get one of their caretakers 
helpers, supporters, family members to work in concert with them to make sure that all of the data is brought to bear on their case. We will make sure all of the questions Social Security needs answered are answered, but most of the time we're going, our goal is to reduce the burden on the claimant from a, from a question asking perspective. You know, I, I heard this wild thing for supplemental security income claimants that they're, they're forced to say, I am too sick, I can't do it over something like 100 places on, on all these different forms. Yes. Our goal is the opposite of that. And so the way it will work is the way the person desires. It can be on the phone or it can be via web. They can do it on their own or our team or their support system can work to make sure they're presenting themselves in the light that is true so the government can evaluate what's going on with their health today, clearly. Um, and, you know, there's the old business entrepreneurial uh, line of, you know, there's no such thing as an original idea. Someone always just takes the grain of an idea and makes it their own. Uh, for the business person listening, entrepreneur listening, what is your model similar to to help people get additional context in terms of how advocate works? Is there anyone doing something similar to what you I... built here? Sure. Yeah, I think there are many excellent accredited representatives and attorneys out there who are doing this very good work for small groups of people today. It's, a, it's an industry that exists today, and they're doing good work for individuals. Um, I also think that something like TurboTax could could be compared to, to what we're hoping to do. Um, but there's a real big difference between a web flow, you know, like the one I described to you, the person can right. fill out the form, they can they can have a family member do it, we can do it for them. That's a TurboTax form filler kind of experience. Useful, not our secret sauce. What we are actually developing is a decision system behind the scenes that understands what does and does not win for who, when, and what the actual outcomes tell us about how we should present the case. That GPS system is the extensible, defensible, modular technology that will allow us to skip across a number of government programs to orient the individual towards what they're entitled to, what, you know, what they've already earned, those types of things. And then also on the flip side of that, though, to clearly communicate when something is not for them, when it is not appropriate for them to be applying. The government I, I, as far as I know, the government can't really do that. They can't really say, hey, you know, outside of an approval or a denial, they must review. Right. But but we may we may have the chance to communicate that clearly in the in terms the individual can understand. Hmm. I know a big part of our conversation today has been about Social Security benefits. And you've alluded to the fact that down the line, this can help in other areas. Why did you want to start here with Social Security benefits? What was uh, and obviously it's, I mean using baby steps, but like you're sort of st starting with this, and then pro essentially you, know, you will scale up. But w why was Social Security benefits uh, an important step to start with? I think there's the investor's answer to that, and there's my answer. <laughs> Social Security disability pay is a very large group of people, and as I as I was talking about before, you know, we all get sick at some point and it's possible uh, many of us are owed some support when we can't work so there's a very large target market in this industry there's there's not a lot of technological support right from the outset so it's a bit of an empty dance floor but the more interesting and true reason to start here is on the individual level, you know, my stepdad, Dave, was very sick a decade ago. He was working at the Stop and Shop Deli in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, and he had a very big stroke, and he could not walk or work in that deli anymore. And there are many families that are on an economic brink or very close to not being able to make it financially, where one event like that can throw them for a loop that they can't recover from. And for me, the, the kind of emotional memory of going through that and then realizing kind of the researcher's dream, going back to my academic times of, wow, this one person, my experience, it hurt me, one. And then two, it is actually 
a common experience. I can take from my one experience and reflect out and up and look around. And many Americans are going through something like that. And so the plain and simple answer is because it is causing a huge degree of pain that I think we ought to be able to diminish. And that deserves world-class best technology, world-class best investors, and world-class best operators. How do you know that Advocate is successful? Give me a time frame. <laughs> I think I know, I know today. In 10 years, you know, we fixed the uh, federal government intake system across like 12 programs. And uh, But give me a minute for that. Today, our, probably our, our most core metric is time to dollars in pocket for the individual who is eligible. So what I'm not saying there is finagling cases that are not eligible into eligibility. What I'm not saying is identifying for huge groups of people that, oh, maybe if they did X, Y, and Z, they could make it. No. There is a group which is eligible that is eventually getting dollars now because they need they need them. And so the shorter that time frame becomes, the more we know what we've done is working. That goal is fairly simple and in in, it makes me excited because there are, I think I have a list of like 50 tactics and approaches to reaching that one goal. And the one that I talked about today is just one of those 50. Awesome. You teased me earlier because I said, you know, AI can't fix this. So let's have the AI discussion. How does AI play a part in Advocate right now? You know, we really believe that there are key opportunities to apply just decision science. You know, I don't want to run into a room and scream AI because it's on trend. It's, it's decision science. It's data science to optimize government filing and more broadly as a more broad mission to diminish the burden of bureaucratic processes. Opportunities span various sectors. They are federal government benefit programs. They are commercial opportunities at, when it comes down to scenarios that involve extensive human processing and decision-making and risk assessment as it relates to something like the Code of Federal Regulation or, or a law system that um, make, may change, but the changes are remarkable and they're not rapid. And so our focus is on developing the prototype. Yes, we will have a web application. Yes, individuals will have a, you know, forgive me, but like a TurboTax-like experience with advocates that I believe in that are, that have been doing this for decades, that are excellent, that used to work at Social Security, you know, that used to work at law firms. We, we have those people and we will have the web presence so that an individual can have a ex supportive experience with us. But genuinely, this is a GPS business. No one needs to know that there's a gigantic decision support engine behind what is powering their claim. They just need the, the dollars to go buy groceries. I have a client who has told me, I can, I can speak about his case. His name is Richard. And he is suffering from a number of ext extremely significant health conditions and has um, been homeless in and out of different friends' houses for the past few months. And last time I talked to him when I was preparing to um, communicate some of what he was going through to our investors, he said, Emily, the thing you tell them is... When I go to the grocery store, I decide if I'm going to buy garbage bags or toilet paper. So I, I can, do not remember last time I had to like make a choice, but that is common. And that is something we ought to be able to, if we don't solve it in a huge sweeping way, you know, you alluded to this as a big audacious goal and a big problem. So what? Let's make a step. Let's try to make a step. But then another one, then another one. Hmm. And so how can people help build advocate now anyone listening hey. to this come across your story like what do you sure. need now to to take advocate as these steps that we've been discussing how, how can you take the next step and how, how can people help do that well we've hired a lot of incredible data scientists software developers and are always on the hunt for more of that style of founder slash employee the reason why I say that is, you know, we're, we're, we are a small team. We, we, we closed our seed round, but, you know, we're a small company. And so looking for owners who see the nature of the problem in its expansiveness and its complexity and its, and its political edges and says, oh, yeah, 
sign me up. Let's figure that one out. Let's get a little piece of that one. That's the style of person that I'm looking for. And the expertise areas are, as I mentioned, data science um, and software development, full stack development. And then I think beyond that, I am looking to work genuinely in concert with the government. That is a hard thing to do. And so what advocate needs and probably what I need are allies who can help me navigate that terrain. Because while I know we can cut down on the wait time for individuals through technology, through support, through a certain method of presentation of the facts, the government needs to receive what we're giving them. And that means we need to be in relation and, and hopefully cooperation. Uh, we joked earlier about uh, you know what you see the company's ROI being in the future, but uh, if I could pop you in a time traveling DeLorean right now and we can fast forward to 10, 15 years from now. What does advocate look like to you in, in that time frame? I, I really feel like for now, in the middle term, our goal is to hook into these judgment-oriented bureaucratic decision processes and roll our technological and analytical approach across them. A few of them exist in the government, but I, I believe that for the problem that we've spent most of today talking about, Social Security disability folks who can no, no longer work in our you know American economy, that anyone who is eligible will have an instantaneous decision in cash and bank account. To say, oh, we're going to be a public company, we're going to be owned by one of these huge government contractors, to say we're going to partner across all the law firms that do this work and um, support them, those tactics, I'm open to any of them and we're pursuing them in a strategic kind of prioritized manner. But the one thing that must be true for what we spoke about today and where we're starting is that there is no wait time if you are eligible. And if you are not, you have a fair understanding of why that is. That second piece is actually going to be hard to do right. as well. It's a great story. It's a great company. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. We could have this conversation five years from now where you tell me, oh, now the wait time's only 20 days. And I'm, I'll be like, yes. Because I, I wrote about this the other day, Emily, and I feel like we've grown into this society where, for whatever reason, we can't celebrate small wins. Like we're mm -hmm. always striving for a Super Bowl or mi that million dollar check, but we really need to start focusing on these small wins. And I feel like that's something that I've taken from our conversation with you that you know that you're not going to be able to solve this problem overnight and continuing to rack up those small wins. Uh, Pat Riley, the famous basketball coach called it the innocent climb of being able to take these little small steps of victories that lead to bigger and grander things. And I and I certainly see that when we talk in the next five years, I'm going to see that you're going to be racking up a lot of small wins and they'll lead to bigger and better things. So thank you so much for your time today, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. And that'll do it for another episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe. That way you'll get new episodes as soon as they're available. And if you have a spare moment, I would greatly appreciate it if you leave a review, which would help other exceptional entrepreneurs like you discover the show. You can always connect with me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or Instagram at Joe Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Adios.